On this very first episode of Movie Mingle, Maggie and I are talking about the movie juggernaut from last year, which was Barbie. So let's not waste any more time and just get into it. I'm the dude, so that's what you call me. Are you a virgin? Yeah, yeah not, not since I was 10. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Come to the coast, we get together, have a few laughs. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. Welcome everyone to Movie Mingle and our first episode. We're doing Barbie, in case you didn't know. And Barbie, one of the biggest movies of biggest, all time. And, I mean, definitely number one from 2023. Absolutely huge, uh, phenomenal success across the globe. A giant pop culture success. $1.4 billion Ooh. around the world. You. And of course, number one movie on Letterboxd's top 55, I guess you could say, for their live action films, and which is why we are here talking about it, yeah. why we watched it again. Again, yeah, um, this was my fifth or sixth time sixth seeing sixth. Barbie. Um, I definitely went two or three times in the theater. I think it was three times. I think you did see it we, three times. Uh, we Barbie-heimered the movie Oppenbarbied. Yeah, Oppenbarbie. Because we saw Oppenheimer first, um, and then after a short break, we went in to see Barbie. But I definitely cried more after Barbie than I did Oppenheimer, oh, that's for sure. yeah. No, I don't I don't think I shed a tear during Oppenheimer at all, but I will get to that when we get to that movie. <laughs> um, to but that yeah, one. Barbie, I thought, was an absolutely wonderful film. I thought it was very deeply important to women everywhere, and I loved it. So some good background about Barbie. It was released, obviously, last year, uh, directed by Greta Gerwig, written by Greta Gerwig and her husband, Noah Brombach, starring the beautiful Margot Robbie. So good. The beautiful Ryan Gosling. The baby goose. The beautiful Issa Rae. Oh, my God. Put her in everything. Then there's Kate McKinnon. Who could ruin my life? (laughs) Uh, Dua Lipa. Who I love in just anything she does is incredible. Emerald Fennell. Who is weird. (laughs) Very weird. And her playing Midge is even weirder. Pregnant Midge. Ugh, and, so of course, uh, Simu Liu. Oh, it's so pretty. And we can't forget America Ferreira, who is finally getting her flowers and is absolutely incredible in this film and broke all of our hearts with a speech that I will rant about later. Um, the, the movie cast is stacked. And, of course, the uh, premise of the film is almost a female Pinocchio, if you really want to break it down to its bassist of stories about uh barbie just going along in her life when everything gets a little squirrely and uh, she goes on a madcap adventure to try to fix barbie land and make everything perfect all the time again it's a wonderful movie about being a human being and being a woman and it uh i loved it i loved it and this movie makes me cry every time i watch it unabashedly and uh, yeah, what about you, K Man? What did you think about Barbie? Well, I absolutely loved it. It's a beautiful movie. It wasn't. It wasn't my favorite movie of last year, but there were a lot of really good. Why? Because there are women in it. Yes, that's the absolute <laughs> reason. I hate. He's women. joking. He's joking. But I also really like the filmmaking aspect of it, of course, because that's an aspect that I'm always looking at when I watch a movie. It was a very beautifully put together film. I really hope so. This has been recorded before the Oscars, um, and I really hope that they're stage design or set design get some recognition yeah production design because it is a beautifully put together film and who doesn't want to run around barbie world i do i want to open every fridge i want to open i want to go down the slide i want a house with a slide i just would love to get into the tactile world that they built for barbie land um so much love was put into this movie i mean all the uh the the homes the Barbie houses the dream houses. the dream houses thank you <laughs> they're mean, all very pink but the, but also made to look everything looked plastic like it was made out of plastic everything looked real from what I remember a dream house looking like when I was a kid and I played with Barbies I mean Margot Robbie really wanted that slide that went down into the little pond little pool in front of her house <laughs> and the pool's fake and the pool's fake or everything's <laughs> fake it's it's, great. it's all about your the kid's imagination how Barbie can. Uh, jump from essentially or glide down from her her roof her her child is lifting her Mm -hmm. from 
the roof to the ground. Um, One of my favorite, I actually put this in my notes and I, I kind of can't believe I'm talking about it this early into the podcast, but what the hell? There are no rules here. One of my favorite touches of this movie is when Barbie opens her fridge and the fridge is not a full 3D refrigerator. It is just a box with a printed sticker of the contents of the fridge like an actual Barbie toy would be. And I love that moment because I had Barbie fridges (laughs) that were just a box with a sticker sticker that you couldn't reach into. And so the fact that that was her real fridge made me so happy. The detail they put into about what it would actually be like to be Barbie living in a Barbie world from a kid's point of view, the way a kid plays with toys. Um, I was watching a behind the scenes clip, how little CG was actually used in the movie, even in Barbie land. We love a practical effect. Obviously the far background environment was green screen, but you know, the, the all of Barbie's world was very real. Um, there was a rumor about exactly how much pink paint was used on the set yeah they said that the world ran out of pink they said the world ran out of pink paint and you know that seems pretty far-fetched so i had to look it up i had to just double check to see what the act what actually happened if the world actually ran out of pink um so when the uh, set designer was working on the movie they the director greta gerwig really wanted a specific type of really just in your face almost headache inducing bright pink so the production designers went to Roscoe, which is a specific paint distributor for film and theater. When they say that the world ran out, this was a quote from the production designer and um, somebody at the Roscoe Paint Company uh, backed this quote up that Roscoe ran out of fluorescent pink. And <laughs> since they do supply the world with paint, for theater and and movie sets, films. They, yeah, they did. Uh, Barbie used up all of this one particular all this color. Fluorescent pink was bought up from Roscoe, um, and that's this, great because that is you great. see it yeah. on on it's the a lot of pink. set. But it's not so much pink that it's nauseating. I grew up in a pink house. When we moved into it, everything was pink: the toilet, the oven, the countertops. Like everything was pink. Um, the outside of the house was a faded hot pink. The inside was a faded hot pink that was a nauseating type of pink that we did cover up actually we got rid of that pink real fast um but in barbie land it makes sense that everything is bright pink and brightly colored and fluorescent and kind of plastic and i thought that that was a wonderful choice that they made because you felt instantly connected to that world i think speaking for myself of course um as a child, like that was the Barbie land that I envisioned. It's, you know, in my head, I couldn't picture anything that's more Barbie than that land Uh, from the plastic waves to the sand on the beach being more of a texture than actual sand, weird Barbie's incredible house. And we'll get to her in a bit, but uh, yeah, why don't we start from the beginning and just talk about the movie as a whole. The beginning of this movie is very memorable because they use a very memorable scene from another movie. It's an homage. Very, very much an homage. To a movie I never want to watch and and will never watch. Maybe on this podcast you will one day, but not, (laughs) it's not on the list, so you don't have to worry right away, (laughs) but we'll get there. Yeah. They open with an homage to 2001, A Space Odyssey, where uh, they talk about the hilarious narrator played by Helen Mirren who I don't really think they could have gotten anybody else to do such a good job. The whole point of that intro was showing the dawn of man. And I feel like this was showing the dawn of woman. But Ooh, not just... The not dawn just of dawn, Barbie. Dawn, well, and that's the, that yeah. was the question that I was asking. Was it the dawn of woman or the dawn of Barbie or both? Um, I would say it's the dawn of... For the movie, for the I movie. think it's both. Dawn of Barbie. I, mean, yeah. I mean, once Barbie shows up and she's taking the place of the Which monolith. has Margot Robbie ever looked better than oh, standing man. in that blue and white In the original suit. Oh, Barbie God. get up. She winks at the kids. Yeah. Um, Great way of introducing not just Barbie character, but also Margot Robbie as Barbie. Yeah, and kind of what we're in for because the introduction is so delightfully weird. Um, I have to admit I wrote down that the little blonde girl with glasses who uh, stares up at Barbie for the first time is wonderful. Uh, Whoever that little girl is, if she keeps up with acting, uh, I think she'll be an incredible actress because that was, she was so good. 
<laughs> just staring at Margot Robbie with awe. But I guess who wouldn't? Because my God, that woman is gorgeous. And then it cuts into a montage about kind of what and who Barbie is. Right. Barbie is all women, and all of these women are Barbie, we're told. Uh, and it was wonderful to see as, you know, a millennial, an elder millennial kid, uh, seeing some of the Barbies that they showcased, especially the one with the long hair and the bright 80s uh, outfit. I had that Barbie, uh, like magic hair Barbie or whatever her name well, was. Well, just showing, too, that before Barbie, all girls had was to play the mother role. Like, yes. That was yeah. the only role for kids, Yeah, because we were given women. baby dolls. Yeah. And you're, you're taught from you're a young age. Learn how to be a mom now. Yeah, to nurture. Um, which is actually kind of an incredible thing because when, when our son was very young, he wanted a baby doll. And so we got him one to teach him nurture because that's what baby dolls are. It's, it's a form of teaching, nurturing, and kindness. And there's nothing wrong with baby dolls. And there's but nothing that's wrong all with baby they dolls. Had. But it's all they had. I mean, I'm almost positive my first doll was a baby doll. I have baby dolls that my grandmother handmade me. Uh, still, actually, they're in our bedroom right now. And baby dolls are a very important thing to every little child out there in the world. Um, I would say they're up there, if not even slightly above the teddy bear, because you think of a baby and you think of them carrying around a little baby doll. Sometimes playing the mom gets boring, <laughs> speaking from experience, and you want something different. And along comes Barbie, who is just flawless and wonderful in every way. And just to get into the movie, the basic storyline is that, you know, you got Barbie living in bliss in the matriarchal society of Barbie land. I want to go to there. She's feeling good about her role in the world and various iterations of Barbies over the years, showing girls that play with her, that they can be whatever and whoever they want. And then you got Ken. <laughs> Ken. Who also lives in Barbie land and is unnoticed in relation to Barbie, which is, however, one step above other <laughs> any other doll. Alan. And Barbie Lynn, such as Alan. Poor Alan. <laughs> oh, the best of all of he them. He just wants to be noticed. <laughs> he just wants to be loved. That's right. And of course, I mean, talk about the amazing Ryan Gosling. Oh, the baby goose. He's so good in this role. He's so good in this I role. I remember when they announced that uh, Ryan Gosling was going to play Ken, and I think collectively everybody went, yeah. Sounds about right. That sounds about right. Sounds I mean, accurate. It was, it's a flawless casting choice to put Margot Robbie as Barbie, one of the most beautiful women on this planet, and then the baby goose as Ken, somebody who can be so charming and so funny and is so pretty. They play together brilliantly. Life as a Ken is not easy, it seems, in the world of Barbies. The Kens very much get sidelined. In fact, there's even a line where Barbie says she has no idea and has never thought about where the Kens live or sleep. So the movie is also kind of showing... I guess the extreme ends of both the matriarchy and the patriarchy. Oh, it's, actually, it's absolutely doing that. Yeah. It does show you, like, this is one extreme in the real, real world, and then this is the uh, the other extreme, the opposite extreme. In a fake, in a could fake, never actually could happen never world. actually happen world. Unfortunately. It's imaginary. Oh, um, I would vote for Issa Rae's Barbie for president. <laughs> so everything, everything starts changing when stereotypical Barbie, which is what... Margot, Margot Robbie's Robbie character is technically called. Uh, she begins to have feelings that she's never experienced before, including the feeling of her ultimate demise, mm -hmm. which... Um, she develops cellulite. Yeah, she <laughs> develops cellulite, which was which was probably the biggest uh, thing that made Margot her... Margot Robbie's <laughs> actual cellulite, too, <laughs> like, which I will talk about in a bit. I love that scene. That's a very important scene, I think. So, of course, she has to go see Weird Barbie to I give her some Barbie. advice uh, to go to the real world, which... Once we, we can talk about, go ahead and talk about cellulite. Well, <laughs> there's so many things I want to talk about before cellulite. Oh. I mean, here we are 16 minutes into this podcast and I'm bringing up cellulite. Um, but I, I will say that uh, the, the decision to put Margot Robbie's actual cellulite on the screen, I think is very important because as women, we are told that, you know, we can't age and we can't change. And I mean, that that gets especially into the speech actresses. later on, especially actresses. But cellulite is a totally normal thing that happens to human bodies. Men have it. Women have it. Everybody has it. Um, we're not supposed to have it because the beauty standards of the world tell us that that's a flaw and we can't be flawed in any way. We have to be perfect. Uh, so showing that one of the world's most beautiful women on this planet can have something as natural as cellulite and then put 
putting it on a giant screen, I thought was a wonderful decision. Which, which leads us also to the line that um, Helen Mirren says that possibly casting Margot Robbie in this role <laughs> may not be the best idea well, to get your point across. Barbie feels ugly, but uh, Barbie is never ugly. No, and but I'm just saying, you know, Margot Robbie herself is absolutely oh, stunning. I don't care if she has cellulite. Mm-hmm. She's an stunning woman and before we get into the weird barbie of it all so in other words before we get into the whole um scene where barbie leaves barbie land for the first time i do want to give some credit to all the other barbies that exist out in barbie land they are all hysterically good one of them who is uh giving a speech at the supreme court i believe she is played by sharon rooney it is the barbie played by actress sharon rooney has a line where she says uh this makes me emotional and i'm expressing it i have no difficulty holding both logic and emotion and feeling it at the same time and it does not diminish my powers it expands them that line the first time i saw it broke me because uh all of my life, all of most women's lives, we have been told that we can't be both rational and emotional. In fact, we often get uh, talked down to or told off for being emotional. And so it's something that women have to kind of suppress in order to advance into the world. And that one line I thought was so beautiful because it is saying like, yes, we can hold these two things at the same time. And it doesn't, make any one of them lesser um so that's a line that i wrote down because that is a line that i look forward to every time i watch the movie it's such a beautiful moment it was a great way of that was the first time where you um really get to hear a character talk and kind of explain and kind of explain what barbie land is that this is not this is not a male centered world like this is it's a place where women can just be can just right yeah and they can be and they can be themselves and all of the wonderful weird aspects of them and it was a good way of setting up the tone for the rest of the movie just like when the barbies win the nobel prize and they're like i deserve this i worked really hard you know if a woman said that while getting an award ever she would be lambasted across the planet people would be so pissed at her but I feel like a man could say that. Like, I worked really hard and I deserve this award. And we'd all be like, yes, yes, you do, Mr. President or whomever. And so, yeah, it really does show that the utopia of living in a female run society. Um, and I, I love those lines. I love those moments. I love all the other Barbies. Emma McKay does a great job. Hari Neff does an incredible job. Uh, when she screams flat feet, it cracks me up every single time. Dua Lipa as a mermaid Barbie, like all of them. They're just all wonderful added onto it. And then I guess you can say in that same moment, all the other Kens are also absolutely incredible. Simu Liu, uh, Kingsley Benadir, Shudi Gatwa, Scott Evans. They're all such incredible Kens in their own way and in their own sort of like Kendom, if you will. Um, All of them play so wonderfully off of each other. And then there's Alan. And then there's <laughs> Sweet Alan, who, who Michael Sarah. Michael Sarah was the best choice to play. Who else Alan. could play Alan? But Michael Sarah, what a great choice. His little dance at the dance party where he like puts his hands up and goes in a circle. <laughs> like that is such a fucking Michael Sarah moment, and I love it. I also love that he's secretly a badass. Um, of course, he is. as we see later in the film when he beats up all the other cats. Michael Sarah is secretly a badass. I think Michael Sarah is secretly a badass. Yeah. All the Barbies, all all the Kens do an incredible job at setting up kind of not only what that world is, but also you know, why it is. But then, you know, when Barbie has her uh, her thoughts of death and has her bad morning, which yeah, is... Yeah, her, her whole house is turned against her. Oh, it's one of my favorite parts of that whole film. This song, nobody but Lizzo could perform that song and do it as well as she does. Um not only in the perfect morning of waking up, but also in the bad morning. Um, oh, yeah, the where, lyrics change. The lyrics change. And they're uh, hilarious. Uh, P, panic. I, I'm scared. N, nauseous. K, death. I, I love how there's a, I love how there's a different in temperature, water temperature from yeah, the it's beginning cold. to, yeah. It's, um, hot, it's regular one moment, and then the next day it's cold, and just it's the burnt waffle. Nothing's coming out of the flask. Yeah, and we've she, all had mornings like that where milk everything just turned goes and, to shit. Like now the milk box has expired all over mm-hmm. it instead of yeah, milk you know, or whatever. It's just a 
Uh, it, that is such a funny scene. So creative. Just watching her struggle through her morning, especially even just when it starts where she wakes up and she's not perfectly just appearing out of the bed. She's like rubbing her face and yawning. And we've all had those mornings. Hell, I had that morning this morning where you just wake up and go, oh, Jesus. So uh, that's, that's a great it's a great way of showing that Barbie's life has changed. I also think that it's worth noting that the the moment of self-realization that Barbie has at the party after she says her dying line, where she kind of realizes that she said it, that everyone heard it, and now she's got to like slowly backtrack it. It's such a beautifully acted moment um, from Margot Robbie. Like the way that she pulls it off just in her face alone is so beautiful and you know there's there's a whole discourse about whether or not she should have been nominated for an oscar i'm well, not we'll gonna fight to it we'll get to that yeah, i'm not gonna fight it either way but she well, does a great it, job we'll get to that. either way um and and that's one of the first moments that you really truly see her at her best is that beautiful short moment of self-realization after she says that line i will also point out the line when one of the barbies says the president is here to which Issa ray replies i am you're welcome Every one of Issa Rae's lines and deliveries, every second she's on screen, is perfection. I think I read somewhere that every movie that Issa Rae was in last year was nominated for an Academy Award. Every movie? Every single movie she was in How last year. How many movies was she in? Like, at least three. I mean, she was in a, a Across the Spider-Verse, American Fiction, and Barbie. And all three of those nice. have been nominated. I don't know if there was another one offhand, but yeah, she's, she's an incredible actress and... Uh, her as the president was perfectly flawless. I will say that uh, Margot Robbie's physical acting is highly underrated. I don't think people give her enough credit for how funny she is and how she moves her body. Uh, when she falls over on the beach, it's hysterical. I think just her in um, the two Suicide, suicide Squad movies and... Um, or that one Suicide Squad movie from uh, James Gunn and the other one that we don't talk about. Well, yeah, the one from David Ayer, and then uh, her, the good one, her own movie, which was a. Uh, oh my God, she! But I'm just saying, uh, she. Birds of Prey is such a great film and doesn't get physical the actress deserves. in all three of those. As yeah, and I don't think that it's ever brought up. Like she is an incredible actress in her own right. Sure, but she is hysterical. Physical comedy. Her physical comedy is so so good, and you see that a lot in this film. Um, the woman can fall like nobody's business. A uh, comparison I came up with, or at least saw, during Kate McKinnon's scene when she's telling Barbie how she can leave Barbie Land, mm-hmm. and she's offered uh, a high heel or a sandal, a Birkenstock. And so, of course, that reminded me of The Matrix. Oh, you know, you're you're yeah, offered you're red the pill, red pill or the blue, blue pill. pill. It, uh, Everything comes back to The Matrix for of men. Of course, makes. <laughs> You choose between the bar, the high heel, which you know will, will she'll wake up in Barbie Land. Everything will be fine. Everything will be fine, supposedly. And then the other one was the sandal, the bird which <laughs> get you to the real world. And so, yeah, one will keep you in the imaginary world. The other one will send Set you, you free. to the real world. And uh, obviously, Barbie also is taking the role of the one by being the the savior in a way for her world. Hell yeah, white savior Barbie. That's right. And um, Ray Perlman's character Ruth plays the oracle <laughs> she's telling the hero exactly what they need to hear before Perlman, saving the world who all of us want to be our sassy aunt because she is another one of uh this world's great treasures i love the whole weird barbie scene well, yeah um, i mean it's you, wonderful you hear nothing but stories from i have plenty of coworkers who had barbie dolls oh, and all so they did was Barbies. cut their hair and mm-hmm. draw on their face and they are, their shirts and one thing too weird barbie is always in the best outfits because they're always like the weird off cuts or like the extras of the outfits that you would get when you played with barbies so like she was never in the pretty dress she was the one that was wearing like the football armor and leggings like weird everybody's weird barbie ultimately was their favorite barbie because to be loved is to be changed and nobody was changed more than weird barbie the line where they uh talk about where they call her weird barbie and say both behind her back and also to her face that long-running joke throughout the film cracks me up because i think it shows the just the straightforward innocence of, that all the barbies have that they're too nice to talk about somebody behind their back so they're gonna also tell them to their face what they feel I love that uh, Barbie has a hard time walking up the stairs in heels for the first time because she can feel how uncomfortable high heels are. I hate wearing heels. So I thoroughly enjoyed that moment. 
where Barbie is like, why am I doing this? Why am I wearing these? Because every woman has had that thought 10 minutes into her evening of wearing high heels with no chance of changing out of them. I also really enjoyed the use of Spice Up Your Life by the Spice Girls. Uh, when it showed the montage of how Weird Barbie becomes Weird Barbie, because that song is just a banger. And uh, it really had a good year last year, being in both Barbie and the Doctor Who Christmas special. So, uh, yay, Spice Girls. Real Go quick, them. I have to mention that I can see your notes. Mm-hmm. And you, just like myself, wrote down just nude blob. <laughs> nude blob. <laughs> that was one of the funniest. <laughs> Who else could deliver a line about Ken's nude blob but Kate McKinnon? That woman is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, in fact, I remember when we were watching the movie, we both picked up our notepads to scribble down after that see, after that nude moment, blob. and we had also, a good laugh about it. Also, it's just fun typing nude blob. It down. really is. It's fun saying nude blob, um, which also brings me to one of my favorite Ken lines uh, about having all the genitals. We'll get to that scene in a second. So, of course, Weird Barbie determines that there is something happening in the real world that someone playing with her being unhappy leading to stereotypical Barbie Barbie, reluctantly heading to the real world to rectify what is happening with that person. I'm glad you said that. That was a lot of R's. I would have struggled. Real world is not... (laughs) Real world. Real world. Man. My, <laughs> and so this leads to a going away party. Um, and I bring that up only because I think that whoever made the banner about uh, going off to the real world and preventing cellulite deserves an award of some sort. Uh, that is probably my favorite prop in the whole movie. <laughs> it's just the giant banner talking about cellulite. Um, I, I love that the whole excuse that Ken gives Barbie... Um, of why he has to go with her. Obviously, he doesn't care about what she's going through. No, he just wants to be with her. Well, he he's like, I can't exist unless I'm in your presence. Mm-hmm. Like, it has nothing to do with even love. Like, he doesn't know what to do if Barbie's not looking at him. Yeah, and we, we'll get to that, Devron, because the, the moment of catharsis that Ken has later in the film is a beautiful thing, but we'll get to that eventually. Um, I... I do love that when Barbie's in her car, she's singing loudly along with the song playing on the radio, uh, something that every woman does in their car. Um, I know that I do it both in my car and walking to the bus stop and at work all the time, constantly singing. Um, So uh, it's a great thing. Um, And then Ken pops up out of nowhere to be like, I have to come with you. Mainly because he kind of wants to, well, he wants to be with her. He wants to exist. But I also think that secretly he wants to show up the other Ken, uh, Simu Lu's Ken, who was like, you would never do something like that. Um, And when Barbie yells, Ken's not cool, I think that's really the best way that we can see how that Barbie feels about that Ken. She just doesn't care about the Kens. Like, they're not a part of her existence. they're, They're there. She enjoys them. But she's not concerned about them the way that they are concerned about her um and i like that it's nice to see a movie where uh, the the female hero the heroine doesn't have to necessarily worry about the love of the man who's in her life i mean she's with him and she cares about him but she's there's no love there and i kind of I, i think that that's a great choice that it wasn't a barbie and ken romance it was a Barbie discovering her own self and Ken kind of coming to terms with the fact that he's never going to get his dream girl. I will also say that uh, Ryan Gosling's Ken and Ken from Barbie Life in the Dream House, which is a show on Netflix that our kid watched all the time growing up. And it's a legitimately hysterical show. It's so funny. But those two Kens would be the best of friends. Um, They would have so much fun just Kenning and beaching off and... uh, and all the other things. If you haven't seen Barbie Life in the Dream House, you should check it out. It's legit really it's funny. Wacky, though. It it's is really wacky. so wacky. But- I was never unhappy when our kid put that on the TV. I was like, oh, I'll watch this. Sure. They get to the real world. They do so by a series of different little little trips. They go in the car. Which I love that sequence. The boat. The, the backgrounds that oh, they use so and beautiful. the little props that they use for Tame traveling. Um, oh, speaking of Tame and Paula. Okay, here we go. I just have to say... The the nominated songs that have been passed around for every award show, um, there are some award shows where they've gotten three nominations, and I can't remember what the third song was 
that was nominated on a lot of them, but oh, it was Dua Lipa's. Okay. It was Dua Lipa's dance because the tonight. Academy Award has a rule that only or the Academy Awards has a rule that states you can only have two songs from one movie nominated. So their max was two, but it was at least nice to know that Dua Lipa got some. Yeah, good for her. Some extra. I literally like everything she does. What was I made for by Billie Eilish and um, I'm just Ken by Mark Ronson and Andrew Wyatt, who are the two main musical, uh, composers. musical composers for the soundtrack or not the sound, but the score and um, original songs. Um, How does this bring us were, to Tame Impala? Because as good as those two songs were, yeah, I love Tame Impala's song that he did for Barbie, Journey to the Real World. It is a great song. Um, I've listened to that soundtrack a lot over the last you know several months since it came out. I wish it were longer. Yeah, that it was not that long of a song. <laughs> I, I mean, remember for being Tame Impala. We were sitting short. in the theater watching uh, Barbie. You know, after having watched Oppenheimer and everything, we're sitting in the theater, and that part came on, and Caveman leaves over to me and goes, "I'm pretty sure that's Tame Impala," and sure enough, and sure enough, it was. I'd never heard it before. I didn't know he was doing original music for the movie. Yeah, but just the fact that he clocked it immediately, I thought was very cute. So they they go through all the different. Uh, little worlds to get to the real world and then they show up in venice beach i truly think that uh there's no way that those barbies would have gotten as much attention as they had in, in real 2023 world, venice 2024 beach. people would not react not that even a little to no. people wearing bright neon while they roller skate like that these days that's a normal yeah like oh look there's a couple in bright neon roller yeah skating. Good they kind of look huh? like barbie and ken oh, they're probably cosplayers i'm gonna you stop might get, and take you my might picture get a with few them. looks like oh yeah wow what's that but nobody's no not the, not the, the way attention. they react in the movie but it's a movie but i can't so there are some issues with the real world in this in the barbie movie that i there's some issues that i have as an adult living in this world that we live in today that kind of ruin it a little bit for me but i can't like i have to struggle not to let them including how quickly they get around southern california there's no way they're getting from fucking century city to hollywood to venice beach in no time like with traffic in the greater la area it takes at least 45 minutes just to get from hollywood to venice beach it takes at least a half an hour to get from century city to venice beach it's not like walking distance I can't let that bother me, but it bothers me a little. Also, just how easily uh, Barbie and Ken were able to walk on to a school. If you're a parent, Barbie, <laughs> she just, Barbie is able to get onto school grounds. Walk onto school grounds way too easy <laughs> for 2023 it's, standards. Yeah, and uh, so those those few little moments. Also, how beautiful the San Gabriel Mountains look behind all the executives in Mattel. You can see these beautiful snow capped mountains. That is not what the San Gabriel mountain range looks like. And so those little things do bother me, but I am a native of Southern Californian. So. One of the best examples of the things that she got a little pushback from, it was when she was sitting at the bus stop, um, looking around at oh, the people around her. And it's when, that was my favorite scene. It's when she looks over at the older lady oh. sitting on the bench with her. And she says, you're beautiful. And the older lady just replies, I know it. And it, every single time I watch that scene, I get choked up because of how pretty it was shot. Just that the slow, such a beautiful moment, the slow moment that Barbie just, the I whole wrote, movie just slows down, takes a breath and it goofiness takes you out of and Barbie world and puts you in the real world. The real world. She's it's for the, the first time that she actually gets to sit down and look at this new world that she's entered. And she gets to watch, um couples be couples couples a, be happy couples happy. argue kids yeah playing. They're, they're both parts of all that just the beautiful moment of watching the trees sway in the wind the beautiful it, music that's playing in the background as, I, as she's watching that is my favorite moment in the whole movie i think it is so suddenly beautiful it is the moment that always makes me cry because it is showing life real life you real know life. it's it's not even the cartoony version of life that like Gloria and the Mattel execs live, it is real life as, as we all know it, which is just sorrow and joy and simplicity and beauty and horror and all of these wonderful things. And then she turns and looks 
at this woman um, who is a famous costume designer. I don't know her right. name offhand. But she looks at this woman and gets to see age for the first time. Because Barbie doesn't age, and nobody in Barbie Land ages. And her automatic reaction is, you just, are you're beautiful. You're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. And then the woman just gets <laughs> just, to say, I know, I know it. it. <laughs> and they is... have that little laugh. I And think... the fact that that almost got cut out because of either some studio exec yeah. or somebody at Mattel. Not understanding. Not understanding. That's kind of the heart of this whole movie. Is it, That's the first time Barbie gets to appreciate what it means to be human which I think then leads her down the road of wanting to be human. It's that wonderful, beautiful moment. And yeah, I, I could talk forever about that scene and its beauty and break it down, but uh, but I won't get to it. But I will say that that is my favorite scene in the whole film. I also wanted to bring up kind of on a bit of a bummer note <laughs> um, that I don't know if it was intended to be this way or if I'm reading into it a little bit, but the scene where Barbie gets arrested and how... First of all, I don't know why she would get arrested for uh, defending, herself? defending herself against a guy who's sexually harassing her. Um, but she does because, you know, they yeah, need a, a bit of a plot he, moment. He smacked her on the butt yeah. and she punched him in the face. Yeah, and like, she's the one who gets arrested, arrested for, for it, it. Be, just because of where the hit was taken. Yeah. Like, essentially, she took a hit to the ass. He took a hit to the face. But she gets arrested. He gets, she's the one yeah. who's in trouble. But then they're almost automatically let go, which also <laughs> shows the privilege that beautiful white people have with the cops because they get to, they just kind of, they, they get just arrested let them go. twice because almost immediately twice. after that, they get arrested yeah, again. They steal clothes. And both times the cops are so gross to her. They're making such terrible comments about her body, about what she's wearing, which is a really sad reality for a woman that, um, Cops rarely believe women. They often victim blame and shame women for coming forward for uh, crimes that are committed by men against women. Like, it's a really horrible thing. And I don't know if that was the intention that Greta Gerwig had or if I'm just reading it into it. But I definitely had a moment where I was thinking about that scene and I went, oh, gross. Because it just sort of shows that women can't trust the police, <laughs> you know. And that's something that we all are very well aware of and so yeah but then you know they cut to the best scene in the whole movie so i i just have to let that moment go i love the moment where ken is also seeing the real world for the first time but his real world is men and horses and men sylvester storm <laughs> stallone it's, it's showing men him in power. Men being yeah. in power where Which, he's from they're not in power they're yeah, the bottom bottom of the totem pole even more i will say that uh, another thing that made me laugh in the movie um is when during the um kind of the montage of barbie trying to figure out who is playing with her at one point uh the character that we will eventually learn is gloria is uh picking a barbie out of a box that reads goodwill on the side of it and i don't know about you but i've never written the words goodwill on the side of a box that i intend to take to goodwill <laughs> it's no. just, it's, they really it's want one I mean, of those movie things that they do. I'm sure a production designer is like, we need, really need to make this. We need to clear make this clear that where these, this box. yeah. So write goodwill on it. Nobody has ever written the words goodwill on the side of a box that they eventually take to goodwill. But uh, yeah, so that kind of all leads into that beautiful scene with Barbie on the bench and with the old woman and seeing life, and then it cuts to uh, the world of Mattel. And I have to give it to Mattel for, I know that there was some pushback, but I have to give it to Mattel for letting Greta Gerwig make fun of them the way they that got, she does. They, it was a fun, I think they they realized, or at least I hope they realized, where she was able to um, tell them. them what the movie was actually portraying. Not portraying Mattel as this evil corporation that doesn't hire women <laughs> in positions of <laughs> higher men. management. Um, or you know they they're like we've had a woman on the board like nineteen sixties <laughs> yes. or something like that like Jesus a long ass time ago. Uh, but it's I, like saying we're not sexist. We love women, but yeah. we don't have women on our staff. But I I did find that all of the execs and Will Ferrell especially have walked this very beautiful line of being kind of feminist but also really smarmy. Sure. So you don't know if they care about women. Or not? Not until a little later. Yeah, a little bit later you kind of realize that, yeah, they actually do genuinely care about the product that they're making and the girls that they're making it for and the people that they're making it for. But in the in all the boardroom scenes, every exec comes across as just real sketchy and smarmy and you don't know what their kind of what their end goal is. Like right. and I don't think that anybody could have played that better than Will Farrell, who oftentimes can be a distraction in a movie for me. Well, and I think somebody must have been 
he could have easily ruined he the could whole have movie. overplayed it, it so have, hard his his acting his mm-hmm. over the top acting could have ruined that whole his the over tone the top, of that movie like, like bro acting that he would have done in like a fucking Vince Vaughn movie sure. would have been someone, too much. Someone was on set. I don't know if it was the director or, or him, or maybe it was him. Maybe somebody just begged him, please be tame. Or he just realized that that's what it was. But like he, he's not he's not Will Ferrell in the movie the way that like anytime you see sure like um, Eurovision, the saga of fire and song. Um, on Netflix is one of just my favorite films. I, it's such a guilty pleasure film of mine. It's so fucking stupid. I like Will but Ferrell. He's very Will Ferrell in it. I like him in it. I just don't like that he, he's saying in it. Yeah, no, I, well, that's another podcast. In that movie, he is so Will Ferrell. Versus here in Barbie, he is Will Ferrell, but he's toned down. And and you expect him to to be kind of like the villain yeah. of the movie, or you, at least one of the villains. First and you're like, oh, you're like, oh boy, guy. here we go, a, a male mm-hmm. Mar- Mattel is that yeah. exact. He's the, the, he's the CEO, the thing, and he's going to be awful. But the moment that I think I realized that he w- was actually like good hearted and meant well was when uh, he he had the option to either go forward with how popular male dolls had all of a sudden mm-hmm. become in the real world. Um, and he, the you know, the company could have made a ton of money. So many off Mojo of Dojo Casa, Casa houses. houses. Yeah, yeah. The, and he was like, "No, we are. This is not right. It's not about the money. It's about Barbie. Yeah. And Barbie is even if the male doll makes." more money mm-hmm. barbie's more important yeah barbie's still barbie yeah yeah no he does a great job in the film and and again like i think i was worried when i found out that he was casting it because you know you never know what you're gonna get with him but he did a great job uh all the execs do a wonderful job aaron dinkins is incredibly underrated the subordinate that brings the whole storyline to mattel basically he is so funny I love his line about how, you know, I'm a man with no power. Does that make me a woman? (laughs) Aaron Dinkins is criminally underrated in this film. But I think that kind of a lot of the, the minor characters are, they're all just done to perfection um, in a great way. And everybody deserves, is it up for like a screen act? Doesn't the screen actors guild give like awards for cast? I mean, Barbie probably won't get it. It may or may not. I don't know. I don't think Um, so. But, the, Everybody in that cast does a great job. There is not a weak point. No, it's a great cast. There were a lot of great casts yeah. last year, and that's probably the problem. Yeah. The BAFTAs just aired not too long ago, and they have a cast, uh, especially British cast, but they have a overall cast, and I think The Holdovers won. Oh, The Holdovers is so good, though. Um, but oh, unfortunately, the Oscars don't have a cast award. No. So... Uh, Barbie eventually ends up at the middle school where she runs into Sasha and where her friends. Where she breaks into a middle school. Where she breaks into a middle detected. school, <laughs> which is impossible, but that's not here nor there. They are all representing the Bratz dolls. I don't know if you actually knew that, Caveman. Sasha and all of her friends are takes on the Bratz doll line. I did not know that. And I know the Bratz line. Yeah, the Bratz didn't know line. That that's what they represented. Was kind of a not a pushback against Barbie, but it was just a hey, you've grown out of Barbie and now you're a tween now. Now yeah. it's time for Bratz it's dolls. Time to grow up and get a yeah, brat. A brat, which is a horrifying doll if you've ever seen I remember, one in person. I remember when they became kind popular. Of I think it was in my early twenties when they really became yeah. super popular you know they're kind of skanky they're kind of ugly i mean this is my own opinion don't come at me brats fans but like our our child never played with brats dolls no. neither of our child's ever i remember played. going to a but kb toy really. store one time and seeing a wall full of brats dolls yeah and so, all, so Sasha, it's been. Sasha and all of her friends are kind of um, makeups of the original Bratz line that came out. In fact, they're even named after the Bratz dolls. In that scene, wow. too, the girl who tells Barbie to never talk to Sasha is incredible. That girl is an incredible little actress, and I want to see her in more things. Even with, like, three lines, she steals the movie. When Barbie runs away running, uh, crying from her conversation with Sasha... And the that girl's just like shrugs and goes, they never learn. Like she is incredible in that film. And I love her and I look forward to seeing her every time I watch that movie. And then that leads us, of course, to Ariana Greenblatt, who plays Sasha. That young woman is living the life that I want to live, which is getting to work with all these incredible people. She had a huge year last year. She was in uh, 65 with Adam Driver. So lucky. She was in uh, Ahsoka. She so was lucky. great in Ahsoka. She was a young uh, Gamora in Infinity War. That's right. That's I mean, like yeah. The this, fact that she got to play a young Gamora and then a go young, play a, a young a Ahsoka. Young Ahsoka yeah. 
two mm-hmm. huge characters. Huge characters. She got to work opposite of Adam Driver and his giant hands. She got to and be in this movie. Be with... in, one, in the one of the biggest yeah. movies of last year, and it's up there with all the big, the the big boy movies. Yeah. And then um, this year, she's going to be in Borderlands. The trailer just dropped for that. Oh, uh, that's who, that's she, who she was. Man, see, she's, she's, she's good living act- the life. When I can't I recognize, when I can't recognize an actress or an actor, just because they just they act different, because they actually mm-hmm. have range, and they disappear into their roles. Yeah. I love because she's an her Gamora and her Ahsoka are different. Yeah, and it's not just because one's green and one's orange. No, they the total different They're characters totally she different plays characters. in differently. The character in the Borderlands trailer is Yeah, she looked great. So different from this and especially this character in Barbie. She's gotten to work with Kate Blanchett, with Adam Driver, Margot Robbie, with Ryan Gosling, with fucking I hope anybody she's in Marvel. A lot of advice from everyone. Yeah, like good for her. This kid is going places. We're yeah. going to see her win an Oscar one day and I'm here for it cuz she's incredible. I hope so. You want to hear when I uh, like a really heavy eye roll from a moment. Yes. I mean, this happens in almost every big commercial blockbuster type movie, but it's when you can blatantly see the commercials. Oh, are we talking about the car scene? The car chase oh, with the Chevy. That is my least favorite part of this whole movie. It's like we need to it's sell a Chevy right now. Awful. I mean, the product placements, first of all, it's a movie about Barbie. It is literally a product placement movie, but there's something about that car chase scene that is so blatantly like product placement. I was disappointed by just this random blue Chevy yeah. SUV being driven around instead of and there's hey, the moment a car where she like puts it in the chase. boost mode or something like yeah. it's so bad. It's so it's which is unfortunate because that whole scene underplays a really beautiful moment of. Um, Barbie and Gloria meeting, realizing that Barbie's there for Gloria, and they have that moment where they shine together, as uh, Sasha puts it, and then instantly become best friends. And I know that any women that are out there listening to this right now, you've had moments where you have met another woman in your life, be it in a bar bathroom, or at the counter of a hamburger joint, or in a grocery store, wherever, you meet a woman, and you're just instantly vibing as besties. And uh, so seeing this incredible chemistry between Gloria and Barbie and where they're just instant besties. I really love that moment. But yeah, in the midst of that is a terrible car chase scene that is just a commercial for Chevy. I do love though, uh, the little moment where Gloria says that she learned how to drive like that from a man. And Sasha asks, was it dad? And Gloria clearly lies and says, oh, of course it is, honey. And Barbie makes a little face where she knows that Gloria's lying. I've had more than one man in my life, <laughs> yeah, honey. It was a beautiful moment. Again, going back to those little moments, uh, those little scenes, those little seconds where Margaret Robbie is just incredible as her acting. We did jump over one of my favorite lines in the whole movie where Barbie is crying outside of the school and discusses how she is, uh, she she's not a fascist because she does not control the railways or flow of commerce. It's a great line. And I also really love how every scene that Ken is in in the real world where he is talking with another woman he is talking at that woman but not to that woman if that makes sense he's never holding a conversation with them he's just talking out loud and these women are there to just stare at him and be like okay and i thought that was a really funny and very like wonderful choice and ryan gosling does a great job at not acknowledging the women he's talking to but still talking at them this uh we also did jump over a little bit um the whole get in the box scene where barbie meets the mattel execs and they're trying to put her back in the box essentially trying to hide her away and you know stop her journey and that scene is so deeply uncomfortable for me i don't know if it's because it's one woman in a whole boardroom of men i don't know if it's the fact that they're trying to hide her away you can tell that she feels unsteady about the choice to go in the box. They're all pressuring her to go into the box. Will Ferrell even has that whole speech about how he loves women because he's the son of a mother, which is such an annoying perspective that some men have where they think that they understand the, uh, 
the hardships of what it is to be a women a woman because they have a daughter or because they have a mom and sister. It's like saying that you're not racist because you have a black friend. It, it is absolutely that, and it's so deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> that whole scene when they start to like tie the ties around her hands, I, f- I find that that seems really hard to watch for me because it just you can feel that undercurrent of violence to it. Uh, but then she gets away and runs off to uh, the song Speed Drive, which I love. And the choreography of her running around Mattel, I think, is absolutely brilliant. That whole scene where she's trying to outrun the execs through the cubicles is very, very funny. I was, I was going to say, mention, you'd mentioned the song Speed Drive by mm-hmm. Charlie XCX. The Such whole, a good song. The whole uh, soundtrack to but this we'll movie to the is fantastic. Yeah. It's um, I don't recognize everybody on the soundtrack, but I know Charlie XCX. I know Tame Impala, obviously. Dua Lipa. Haim, Sam Smith. God, that Haim song is so good. But we'll get to the soundtrack, because at the end I'm going to ask you about... Sure. <laughs> I can promise I'm going to ask you about the soundtrack. I loved when she meets Rhea Perlman for the first time in that little cozy kitchen where, you know, where the, the ghost of Ruth keeps an office on the 17th yeah, floor. Just like the Oracle from the Matrix. Yeah. They talk in a kitchen. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see that. I see. Um, I didn't connect those two points. Barbie is the one. <laughs> Barbie is the one. She fights for us all. Oh, my God. Will Barbie save us from uh, Agent Smith? I love the way, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but um, when Barbie takes a sip of tea, the way that she holds the cup and kind of awkwardly brings it to her mouth, you're watching it's Barbie the first time she's ever drink drank a liquid. liquid. Yeah. And again, just going back to Margot Robbie and her incredible physical acting, the way that she holds her mouth, the way that she folds her hands, I and, thought that was a brilliant moment. And it seemed like she was drinking from an actual cup that had mm-hmm. liquid in it, which is one of my biggest pet peeves. Huge. When you watch a movie or a TV show where a character drinks from an obviously an empty cup. Yeah. And it's... So it's, many TV shows are guilty of that. What is so hard about putting a little bit of water in there and give it a little bit more weight and yeah. have somebody... I know that, you know, drinking a lot, you know, when they have uh, some dialogue to say, you know, eating food or drinking liquids can mess up the, the acting and the dialogue doesn't get out mm-hmm. of... But they're, I, I don't know, cut for a moment and let them yeah, <laughs> wipe their mouth spit or, it something. Out or something. Like, right. it's just, yeah, Too no. Too many bathroom that's... breaks. Like, the, the, the obviousness of how light the cup they're holding is and how you could just tell they're not swallowing. All I can see is just Nathan Fillion, Nathan and, Fillion in a receiving fucking, yeah, a cup of coffee from in Castle. Castle. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, see, some is, actors are worse at uh, pretending, pretending about that there's actual Nathan Fillion's in wonderful. There. We love you, Nathan Fillion. If you're here listening to this, we love you. But like the the empty cup acting bothers us for everybody. Uh, this is a little insight too into uh, mine and Caveman's relationship because this is a conversation we have had before many times. Uh, Barbie escapes the building. She meets Gloria. We have that horrible car commercial a sequence. I really enjoyed the moments where we get to see all of the memories that Barbie's had from Gloria's point of view, where um, she's playing with her child. Uh, she's playing with Sasha as a kid, playing Barbies, um, the moments of comfort, the moment of, of distress, the moments of just having a teen. We have a teenager. Um, and there are moments where like we struggle to get our teen to talk to us about things. Like, you know, it's, it's hard to be it's a beautiful struggle of motherhood that is shown when uh, in Gloria's memories of trying to connect to Sasha and being unable to. That being said, I have never hated my own mom as a teen. I never hated my own mom as a teenager the way that Hollywood told me that I would. I don't think I ever at one any given time yelled at my mom, you don't understand me or anything like that. But Not, not to say no kid has ever said no, that. No, but uh, Hollywood definitely S- makes it a lot more dramatic. <laughs> but that's what we love about movies and Hollywood. When you get a preteen, you're expecting one thing because Hollywood's always told you yeah, preteens gonna be act like. this way and then your child finally turns 13 you're like oh you're still pretty chill so uh, Gloria, Sasha, and Barbie head off back to Barbie world and I, we get the first real major hint not the first but we get the real major hint during that scene where Gloria talks about how she always viewed Ken as kind of being useless and and not necessary which is why it's very clear that since Gloria since her own sort of opinions and ideals about Barbie are what are framing Margot Robbie's Barbie journey. Um, The fact that Gloria doesn't necessarily care about Ken is why our Barbie does not care about this Ken. And I don't know if you ever kind of caught on to that because it's a real quick line, but I think that's the main reason 
that Barbie is not super into Ken is because Gloria is not super into Ken. Gloria doesn't need a man to fix Barbie. She needs Barbie to fix Barbie. Yeah, they're kind of, they're definitely representative yeah. of the people who are in, in the real world, whether they're directly um, influencing them as just being the person that's playing with them. Mm-hmm. Kind of makes you wonder who's playing with weird Barbie. But weird Barbie is being played by all kids who are playing with weird Barbie. That's every, every, I'm sure there was one. I don't know. I feel like Weird Barbie is all Weird Barbies. So they they get back to Barbie World, and Barbie World has turned into a Kendom. And uh, what proceeds is a hilarious scene where Barbie is driving Gloria and Sasha around, trying to show her, trying trying to show them, you know, her wonderful world, but it's been taken over by men. Um, which gives us not only the great line of Brewski beer. Hey, honey, can you get me a brewski beer? <laughs> but also, John Cena is always a welcome sight, even as a mermaid Barbie. I love John Cena I cameos. love John Cena so much. Anytime he just pops up and I don't know, it's just like, eh, John Cena, yeah. And he doesn't take me out of it, even though no. it's very hard to hide John Cena as I anything mean, other Cena's, than John Cena. Yeah. yeah like, he's you know not it's somebody him. who's disappearing into Ooh. roles, but even if he's a mermaid. I'm just so happy to see him. Uh, I guess uh, as it goes, they were filming uh, one of the Fast and Furious movies, Fast X, at the same time that they were filming filming Barbie. And John Cena literally begged to be in Barbie, uh, saying that he would do whatever they needed him to do. And so they turned him into a merman. And I'm here for it because anytime I get to see John Cena in my life, I'm a very, very happy woman. The Depression Barbie is incredible. I would fundamentally have Depression Barbie and I would also buy the anxiety pack sold separately because I have both those things. Another thing uh, I was wondering is um, how many guys after they saw this movie, how many do you think learned to play Matchbox 20, 20's push on the guitar after they are, saw it and played it at their partners? Well, staring not, uncomfortably not in their getting, eyes for Not getting the mes- message at all in the movie. I do feel like... <laughs> A lot of men have done that. I know that as as a woman who grew up in, you know, the early 2000s and was a teenager, a lot of my guy friends played guitar and would sit and play guitar for us. So I've had several moments where I've had to sit in a living room with a dude playing guitar badly and just going like, I don't like it. I don't like it. But not being able to say that because we're not allowed. So going back to the part where Barbie comes home to her dream house to find that it's been overrun by the Kens. There is this really beautiful moment where Ken, after sort of devastating Barbie, he looks at her and goes, how's that feel? It's not fun, is it? And I think that that line is important because it's the first time that Ken is being real to Barbie. He's admitting his hurt feelings, even to himself for the very first time. We see the real Ken in that moment and he's being an asshole about it. Absolutely. But I also think that he's sad and he just wants to be understood. He wants to know what life is like. Uh, he wants Barbie to understand what life has been like for him as a Ken living in her shadow this whole time. And now all of a sudden, it's not about Barbie. It's about all the Kens. And I, I love that moment. I love the way that uh, the baby goose acts it. I love how sad he looks in that moment, too. Because that's when he starts to like cover his face with the two sunglasses and like puts on the whole big bravado about everything. But that's a very beautiful and very important moment. And for Ken Ken as a character when he finally just looks at Barbie and says this is how you've been treating me and I don't like it um I thought that was a really really wonderful moment Ken needs therapy I think the uh main breakdown to this whole story is Ken needs therapy so Matchbox 20 deserves all the praise for allowing themselves to be the huge (laughs) butt of all the jokes all the jokes like it's uh, especially on the scene where they're all like sitting at the beach and they're all (laughs) all the different all the different cans and all the campfires and they're all playing the same song how did you feel about the speech i mean it's stuff i've heard before in other movies or tv shows especially tv shows i've there are enough tv shows that have talked about the struggle the struggle and how hard it is to be a woman and just the speech wasn't really uh for, I think for general audiences, it was taken very well. Like, it was a powerful speech. It spoke to me. You, know, you had a lot of conversations about that. But critically, it was not really... The movie didn't really hit a lot of critics the same way for that speech, if you're judging it by that speech alone. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a, definitely a turning point in that film where you really get to listen to a character just unload about what it's like on a daily basis just to be female 
Um, the main argument is that there were many movies, especially this was a movie, if we're talking about feminist film, mm-hmm. this was a movie where the subjects they bring up, people already talked about them in 80s films. There are there are films since then who have, that have also done it. And whereas America Ferreira's, her big moment was only skims the surface of what women around the world are going through. Um, Tell me more. Tell me more, caveman. So man, Barbie about what a, women around the world are going through. I'm only <laughs> saying from my point of view of listening to women talk. Okay, so critics were like, hmm, on the speech a little bit. So a film critic by the name of Maria E. Gates, she called it a feminist starter film that was already made in the 80s. Like that's where the feminism is here in the 20s, but now we're repeating something we've already said in the 80s. So you're saying that uh, that the Barbie movie is putting feminism back about 50 years? No, Isn't but it's talking Sasha? about not putting it back, but talking <laughs> about things that they've talked about since the 80s. Yeah, and things haven't changed well, since the for 80s, Americans, which is why well, women are I still think for, so fucking tired. For Americans, is laying the groundwork for future feminist cinema to be mm-hmm. made to do even a better job than what Barbie did. The There are women in other countries where there's more to think about than just the pressure of being pretty or having a job. Yeah, There's a lot more going on in their lives, uh, but Americans, that's those are the things that... But that's not, is that your point of view or is that just you kind of doing research about what this was, this was, this was, well, this was, well, that's what I'm talking about is critics talking about this movie specifically. But how did, okay, that's all well and fine because critics are their own people and they're allowed to feel what they want to feel. How did you feel about the speech? When, in the moment when I was watching it, it was a very powerful moment in the movie Mm -hmm. and a great speech and delivered very well by America and definitely makes you go, that's sucks yeah and yeah, it does so so much obviously having that information was good and that's that was my argument against the critics i'm yeah. not saying that i'm taking the critics side i'm just saying that yeah, just my kind of... my what i'm my um he's really good at playing devil's advocate I listeners. Am. my argument against the critics was that this movie was made for not just women mm-hmm. but also for men not just feminist not just feminists, not just people who even know what the word feminist means. Mm-hmm. You know, this movie is also trying to reach kids. This is a movie that's very much, you know, you, we took you took our 11-year-old son to see this movie. Yeah. And his so reaction for, to the speech was indifference at best, but at 11, I kind of don't know whether what he thinks about it. Sure, but you want the movie to be other. accessible for all yeah. ages, all sexes. You know, we're not we're not just specifically talking about, of course, like Men and women in the binary we were no. talking about, you know, all well, people. They they essentially that's in the movie. They in talk the movie about is a very and women. yeah, it's a very men and women movie. The speech for me obviously was groundbreaking. I wept my fucking face off during that scene in the theater the first time because all of a sudden here was somebody saying these things on a big screen in a packed movie theater in a a movie that we knew i mean we knew going in to seeing this film that it was going to be a huge film and so seeing that moment where america Ferrera just sits back and unloads on how hard it is to be a woman in this world in this culture in this country was a beautiful thing for me i you know i'm just your average like white woman living in america but you know like i have a certain amount of privilege but i don't have all the same ones that like a ken would have and so seeing a character just sit back and america Ferrera is so good at giving frustrated exhausted speeches and you would know this if you watched superstore which i think is a criminally underrated sitcom she is so so good in it and she gives great speeches in almost every episode but the speech for me was it was beautiful it was life-changing and what hit me the most was when she lists all the parts about nevers you're never supposed to be loud you're never supposed to be totally outgoing you're never supposed to be you know we're, women are supposed to be all of these things we're also not allowed to be a bunch of things she says that we're we never can be a show-off you can never be rude you can never be selfish you can never fall down never fail never show fear i as a human being who i am in my soul is against all of those things i am a loud outspoken woman i've always been around guys my whole life you know so like i know how to handle guys and put them in their place 
And that has put me at odds my whole life. I have lost jobs because men have not liked how I talk to them. I have gotten in trouble at jobs because women have not liked how I talk about men. I, I, I have lost friendships over deep-seated patriarchy issues. Like, I am a woman that has fought against these things just naturally my whole life. And it has put me at odds against the whole world. And so when she talks, when Gloria talks about those things, all the things that you're never supposed to be, they're all the things that I just already am. And so that too affected me really deeply because here I am, just this outspoken, weird looking little woman who goes out into the world and takes no shit. And men don't like that. But it has never stopped me. And it has never changed my mind to be anything other than who I am. But a lot of women don't have that luxury. They don't have the boldness that I have been sort of imbued with. They don't have that false sense of grandeur that I live my life every single day with that was given to me from my dad. I learned that from my father. So I I think that, you know, there are a lot of women out there that the speech really touched extremely deeply, you know, myself included, because it was things that we had never heard before on such a big platform. I don't know if you're aware of this, but relationships ended over that speech. Like women took their boyfriends to see that movie and their boyfriends would look at them and be like, why are you crying right now? Like they didn't understand the importance of that speech and it cost them their girlfriend. And I think that that's great because it was finally a moment for women to see that like it is so hard. We all know it and we all struggle. And if a man couldn't appreciate that speech, they're not worth keeping. And we're back and we are going to talk about the deprogramming of all the Barbies, uh, which is, I mean, like this whole movie is wonderful, guys, don't get me wrong, but I do absolutely love the scene where uh, they realize that they can deprogram all the Barbies from the nonsense of the patriarchy by just talking about the cognitive dissidence of being a woman. I think that whole scene is flawless, but I especially love how all of the different Barbies play being the stupid woman in need like you know the fragile woman who needs a man every single one of them playing that type in in that whole scene cracks me up you've got the one barbie talking about photoshop and not being able to understand how to do it you've got the barbie who doesn't know how to save money the barbies that don't know what's you know how to do different sports and just playing against all the different Kens in that scene. It's so, so funny. Do you want to talk about Zack Snyder's Justice League with me? I do not want to talk about I was just going to bring it up. That's just how that beautiful speech that Gloria makes, this absolutely stunningly beautiful, important speech leads into a hardcore Snyderverse fucking burn. It's amazing. I thought that was hilarious. And that was absolutely that. hilarious. I love the whole bit where the, the glasses make Barbie ugly and Ken removing her glasses makes her beautiful. And as a woman who wears glasses all day, every day, I especially found that scene very funny. I mean, it's a great callback to like movies from the Oh 90s yeah, she's, with, all, she's that all that and all those films. Okay, man, am I prettier without my glasses? Holy shit. Oh, it's a new woman. Oh, no. I put my glasses back on. Hobgoblin. Oh, it's just Maggie. <laughs> I, uh, I I love that. I love that part in the movie. I think it's beautiful. One, I am going to bring up one thing that makes me irrationally angry, kind of for no reason. That beautiful Chanel necklace that Margot Robbie wears when she goes to meet Ken to convince Ken to go out with her for the night. That is now owned by Kim Kardashian, and that just upsets me Wow! because uh, I feel like that should be a piece that's in a museum or on display or literally owned by anybody other than Kim Kardashian, who I'm not a huge fan of, but it bums me out that she saw that movie and then went out and bought that exact necklace. So, you know what I think might be Ryan Gosling's, like, moment, like, scene for the Oscars is where Barbie goes to the Mojo Dojo Casa House and convinces him to go out with her and he ducks around the corner and yells sublime sublime (laughs) Sublime! that is such a sublime moment ryan gosling really deserves all the the love and joy and awards and just just notice that he's gotten for this film he does such an incredible job as ken 
and in that scene in particular, I think he's wonderful. I mean, we'll get into like the Oscars, the Oscars soon, things, but yeah. it's a little bit of a shame that I mean, good for Ryan Gosling; he did a great job in the movie. But it is, I mean, Margot Robbie's an amazing actress, mm-hmm. and the person who played Barbie in the Barbie movie didn't get nominated, but yeah, Ken did, Ken which kind of goes by. Oh, it is one hundred percent like kind of like this meta thing on. It could have been an end credit scene. New, yeah, that it could have been Ken instead in, of her seeing a gynecologist. Yeah. She could have. <laughs> she could have found out that Ken. <laughs> got nominated for an oscar and she Ken got nominated for this and i didn't <laughs> um but yeah we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit um i do want to talk about the song i'm just ken i think that that song is flawless it, it is that song is so funny it is it's a brilliant look into the heart of ken it, not only who he is to his core but just also what he's about. The line that hurts me the most in that song is where he sings, I'm no dreamer. Because Ken in this movie is not a dreamer. The only thing he wants is being the presence of Barbie. Like he can't see himself as anything other than Ken. Right. He does not dream for himself. And that line makes my heart hurt a little bit. And I think that it's kind of, uh, that line is quickly overshadowed by the fight that's happening on the beach and uh, leading into just call the kind of calamity of the choreography of that scene, not only the fight, but also then the dance sequence, which is all brilliant. You can see it on every single one of those Ken's faces. They're having the time of their goddamn lives. That dance doing sequence, that sequence. Looked, was so much fun. I love watching that. It's that's one so of my, good. That's one of my favorite parts of the movie is that um, as far as visuals go, that yeah. whole dance sequence is... It, Fantastic. The baby and, goose deserves an Oscar for how well for how serious he well, takes that. Well obviously they sequence. get to perform they get to perform that song mm-hmm. at the Oscars. I can't wait. I can't wait I can't to see that at the Oscars. Wait to see that. Um I really hope that like Scott Evans and Shooty Gatwa and Ben uh Kingsley Benadir and all of them, I get I hope that they get to be a part of that sequence. And I if anybody's wait. curious whether or not Ryan Gosling's gonna be singing at the Oscars. Is he? I don't think so. I don't think anybody does. I think everything is lip sync because it's live. The the girl who played Moana when she sang at the Oscars, she sang live because there's a moment where as she's singing, she accidentally gets hit in the head huh. with a flag by one of the background dancers, and it doesn't break her stride at it'd be, all. It'd be interesting to know what they're going to do. Yeah, because it's going to be fun. Ryan Gosling definitely was using getting a little bit of help with some auto tune. Yeah. He's got a great voice. He, he did does. a wonderful job in La La Land. He did. When we get to La La Land, we can talk about the baby goose and how well he sings. I mean, I think it fits for Ken, too, to be a little auto-tuned. My favorite line in that whole song is, I'm just Ken, and I'm enough, and I'm great at doing stuff. That's a brilliant line, because that just shows how how kind of stupid Ken is, that he can't rhyme anything other than stuff with enough i also really love when all the kens are riding back to the dream house they're all doing the monty python horse yes, gallop that was and <laughs> they're not riding actual horses <laughs> they're pretending like uh the monty python boys did well and i love too wonderful. that the only reason that uh the whole it's funny that <sighs> It's funny that when Ken says that the entire time he thought the patriarchy was just horses. Yeah, he was just about horses. Yeah. And he lost, he lost interest. He lost interest once he found, once out, he found out. out. That's all he wanted was just horses. I absolutely love the line, too, when uh, Kingsley Benadir uh, leans forward and is like, uh, weren't we supposed to vote on something today? And Ryan Gosling is just like, oh, when he realized that he's been played. I think that's such a beautiful moment of acting. And this does lead to the kind of climactic end of the movie, which is uh, all the Kens and all the Barbies, the Mattel execs, and uh, Gloria and her daughter back at the dream house. These are dream houses, motherfucker. That was an unexpected line in a Barbie movie. And I love that Issa Rae got to <laughs> got to say it as she's walking down those steps, just the most confident president ever. I, I love I love that they allowed that line to stay in the film, even though they they bleeped it. Uh, as we all well know that most PG thirteen movies have a chance to put a fuck in there somewhere. They get one. They get one and this one was used perfectly in my very humble opinion. And then, of course, that leads to uh, Barbie and Ken having a very emotional moment where Barbie gets to tell Ken that, like, life shouldn't all just be about her for him. It, like, he needs to figure out what he wants to do in this world. 
And there is a absolutely incredible line delivery by Ryan Gosling, where he just looks at her with big, sad eyes and says, Beach, he's so good. And he deserves every accolade that he's getting for this film. That is such a great moment because she she finally gets to offer Ken, I guess, the grace and the mercy of allowing him to realize that he is not ruled by her existence and that somewhere along the way he got lost in the idea of his girlfriend so to speak and he was he lost his own person I mean you and I both know people who got into relationships and completely lost who they were as a human being because they became so wrapped up in who their new partner was so I, I really think that that's a beautiful moment in the movie where she gets to offer him the, the mercy and the grace of finding himself apart from her. And I love that. I love the end of the movie. I love Barbie in that yellow dress. We have that great scene where Gloria gets to offer up her own idea for real world Barbie, who just wants a flattering top and to make it throughout the day feeling nice, which I know as a 39 year old woman, I too just want a flattering top and to make it through the day feeling nice about myself and not hating myself. And then we see Ruth again. Ruth comes up and takes Barbie away to a womb like environment. I don't know if you clocked that the few times you've watched this movie. No. But the uh, the room that they live in is very womb-esque. It's very, you know, it's just distant colors, distant sounds. And we get, again, one of, one of my most favorite moments in the movie, a chance for Barbie to become real. And in doing so, we get this montage of women, real women. All these women were apparently uh, the women in the lives of the people who made this film. And using the same song from yeah. earlier at the bus stop the billy which is song. one of my yeah one of my favorite yeah. songs it's such a beautiful it's been a little overused by tiktok these days but sure. it's still at its core which is why i think song. i feel like that's not specifically because of tiktok but i think i'm just ken is going to be the clear you i mean think i'm just ken is going to win over, it's been winning a lot yeah over the other two and i think just having yeah, I think, I think people are burnt out of it because of its use on social media. So I can understand. I think it would be great. If I don't know how the Academy voters are, but I, th- I think people are just more into Ryan Gosling as a person than they are Billie Eilish. I mean, Billie Eilish has also won an Oscar. She won an Oscar for uh, that James Bond song. So it'd be cool if she won another one. She's got such a long career ahead of her. This is not going to be the last time that she's ever nominated for an Oscar. But I think that if it did go to I'm Just Ken, it would be great. It would be like... It's not impossible. I'm just saying... It would be like the Oscar going to is... Man or Muppet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which still remains one of my most favorite... Um, best original song oscar wins of all time <laughs> i still think that everything is awesome should have gotten it too but that's neither here nor there the the montage of real women of women leaving of leading their lives it it wrecks me every time that is still the point that i like cry when we watched it the other day that's the moment that i actually started crying was watching this incredible montage of real women just being brave and being happy and being sad and being beautiful and being all of those things. Um, there's a woman who's doing her makeup and winks at the camera. For some reason, I really just adore her. There's an old woman who's like dancing in a kitchen. All of those little moments are so, so beautiful to me. And in that, you also see Barbie become real. You get to see her take her first breath. You get to hear her heartbeat mm, and start, yes. which why moves me to like think of the womb-like nature of the room that she's in with Ruth. It's literally that moment that we see Barbie become real. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's essentially her birth. It is her birth. Yeah. And I love every single second of it. And that's when I sat back and thought, oh, shit, this is a female Pinocchio story. And I hate Pinocchio. I hate that story. Pinocchio's on the list. I know. And I fucking hate that but story so much. But it's Guillermo del Toro's much, Pinocchio. Which might make it better, but it's still Pinocchio. And I hate Pinocchio but I love this movie no matter what and then we go to uh, Barbie in the real world um, being dropped off by her new family of Gloria and Sasha and the dad who was just so great I know that he's America Ferrer's actual husband every line of his in the movie is hysterical then we get to the best closing line of a movie I've seen in a long time which is I'm here to see my gynecologist I cackled so loudly 
when I first heard that line. What a genius, genius way to end that movie. A great way to end it. And then the hard cut to fucking Nicki Minaj singing the Barbie Girl song. Absolutely wonderful. I, I think that it's, I mean, a whole podcast could be written just about that song, but instead it's just a great, great end to a great movie. I would say Barbie easily for me is probably an eight out of 10. I don't know about you. But, uh, oh, out of 10? Yeah. It's easily like an 8, 9 out of 10 for me. Like, it's up there. I wouldn't say it's completely flawless, mainly because of that fucking commercial car chase scene. But <laughs> yeah, I'd say 8, 9 out of 10 for me. I love I, this film. I'd probably give it a 6 or a 7. Okay. There might be a half star somewhere in there, too. I think uh, I think on... Well, no, I didn't rate this on Letterboxd, but they do add a 5. And I'd probably give it a, a 4. Yeah, I could easily give it a four out of five. Because although it is I don't a know why wonderful six film, out of ten it makes it lower, and out of five makes it higher. But well, maybe since we're doing letterbox scoring, we should do it out of five then. I mean, that's not because we idea. are far <laughs> following. So yeah, I would say I would give it a four out of five because yeah. it's it's a wonderful film, and there are little moments that I don't like, and there are little moments that have been kind of taken over by social media that have kind of ruined them for me a bit. But I still love it. <laughs> So this part of the podcast is where I ask Maggie two questions. Yay. Somehow Palpatine returned. So Maggie. Yes. Would Barbie have been better if Oscar Isaac was in it? Absolutely. Okay. And then the second question is, which character would he have played? So uh, since this is the very first podcast, I will go into a bit of background. I love Oscar Isaac more than any other actor on this planet. He is my absolute dreamboat actor. He is everything. He's so beautiful. I fucking love Oscar Isaac. And there's no jealousy between Caveman and I when it comes to our uh, actor or actress crushes. You know, we know that we're each other's shapoopies and that's what matters in the end. But like, yeah, I would absolutely eat Oscar Isaac's beard if given the chance any given day. So yes, this movie would have been better with Oscar Isaac in it because everything is better with Oscar Isaac in it. I think he would have made an amazing sugar daddy Ken. Just a little cameo holding that little dog. And I think that sugar daddy Ken and earring magic Ken should have been played by Oscar Isaac and Pedro Pascal respectively, because just having them in those roles would have been everything. And I definitely would have had, um, that as my screensaver on my phone forever so yes yes oscar isaac should have been in this movie as sugar daddy can it would have made me so happy i love him so much and now we're gonna do the news this week on our first episode we're gonna talk about barbie and the oscars well, just a little bit of background on some of the awards. It has won a lot of awards right now. The Oscars are still... A couple weeks away? Yeah, it's March 11th. It's a Saturday, right? Or Sunday, right? It's a Sunday. I yeah, it's the 10th. The so this movie has won 160 awards. Damn. Over, you know, that's worldwide mm-hmm. of all the different award held. ceremonies, all the different ones that are held all around the world. I know Margot Robbie has won some awards for her acting. Mm-hmm. So it's not like she didn't win anything. Um, that brings me to the discourse about the Oscars. The discourse about the about the snubs. Yeah, because I mean, it did. It was nominated for eight Oscars. Yeah, obviously the two songs are two of them. Mm-hmm. Best Picture of the Year is one of them, which is great. Yeah, you it know, won't get it. But it it's won't great. get it. But yeah. it's it's still on the list. Mm-hmm. Out of you know, it's, and that's out of ten movies. So to be listed at the as the top 10 best movies of the year other than the fact that it made so much money mm-hmm. you know there was a day i don't remember what movie i went to go see but it was a it was the other popular movie out it wasn't oppenheimer but it really doesn't matter what it was i came out of the theater one day while barbie was still playing and making a ton of money and there was just this massive crowd of women wearing pink yeah i wore a pink shirt and too, but it was just this massive you like, wore a pink shirt almost barbie. as if they came from the same area but they probably didn't they it was like 20 to 40 mm-hmm. women all in pink it was a huge the, cultural phenomenon out in the lobby of this yeah. theater Going to go watch the the outfits that people made just to go see this movie were beautiful. Like people got into the idea of dressing up to go see this film. Like people got into Barbie. Um, and even though Margot Robbie was not nominated, nominated for, an for an Oscar, which should she have been? 
Yes, I think she should have at least been on the list. Yeah, just like because she, she got a she was nominated for a Grammy. I or not a Grammy. <laughs> she was Globe. nominated for a Golden Globe, and I can't remember if she won or if it was Lily Gladstone. I think Lily Gladstone. I think um, Lily Gladstone got the, has gotten all of them. Like I, I don't think that she hasn't missed uh, one that she's been nominated for, which she deserves all of those nominations. I did not see Killers of a Flower Moon, but I've heard nothing but incredible things about her. Personally, I think. Margot Robbie Mm -hmm. was the best actor in this movie. Yes. Therefore, I think she should have been nominated Mm -hmm. for best actress. Just if you're going to nominate America Ferreira and Ryan Gosling. They nominated America Ferreira because of that speech, though. No, I'm not saying Margot that like, had she didn't great, serve it. Margot Robbie had great dialogue, too. Yeah. She, it, it might not have been a speech. Margot Robbie had it, great range in this movie from playing that naive, sort of sure. like silly blonde Barbie Sit, to who she is at the end of that film. And she's talking to Ken her about... her sitting on the, on the bus oh, bench looking around and just taking living, it all in. Yeah. Living, yeah. That alone, I don't know. It's the Barbie movie. Should Barbie have been nominated just automatically? No, nobody says that that's a rule, but... I just felt like of all the acting in that movie, Mm -hmm. Margot Robbie was the best. So you've seen um, the top five movies that the actresses have all been nominated for, right? You've seen Poor Things, Killers of the Flower Mood, Nyad, Maestro, and Anatomy of a Fall, right? Yeah, I've seen all every single one of those movies. Who would you take out to put Margot Robbie in? Because... I mean, the only two that I could think of, because I've heard you talk about Sandra Huller and Anatomy of the Fall at length. So I kind of feel like you would take out either Annette Bening or... I probably would have taken Annette Bening out. Annette Bening was great in Nyad. Um, I haven't seen it. I've seen poor things on that um, list, by the way. I'm really rooting for Jodie Foster to win Best Supporting Actress. I don't think she has a chance. No, she doesn't. No. She doesn't. I know she's not going to win, but I'm rooting for her. You know, it's just like a Super Bowl. Like, I'm rooting for this team, but I know they're going to lose. But I thought Jodie Foster's acting was superb uh, compared to America Ferreira's, Mm -hmm. for example. This is all for me just saying that I think Margot Robbie should have been in there. If you haven't watched Nyad, uh, it's not going to be on this podcast, at least talking about it. What about... Really good movie. Really good acting by both actresses what about um greta gerwig and getting director greta gerwig was that a snub i don't think it was a snub i think this year we just had too many amazing amount of talent when it came to directing well of course god forbid they nominate two women for best directing act like they had to get their token woman in with justine yeah if you haven't seen anatomy of a fall he won't shut up about it better film than barbie if you want a female director in that deserves it it's justine trier from anatomy of the fall yes you can always put in another female director doesn't they say haven't yeah i know that's the thing is that they haven't right and they could have easily but who would you have taken out like, yeah that's the thing i haven't seen zone of interest but I, you won't shut up about zone it of in- yeah, uh poor things was right incredible now. It was a beautifully done film. Oppenheimer, I think that Christopher Nolan deserves it for Oppenheimer because that was kind of such a big film. And if you think Is Martin Scorsese just getting it because he's Martin Scorsese or is it because Killers of the Flower Moon is actually really a good movie? Killers of the Flower Moon. If Greta Gerwig really deserved to be in there, I think the one director that doesn't belong on the list is Martin Scorsese. <laughs> You're going to get some hate for that. Uh, who directed Past Hot Lives? Take. Hot taken. Was Did a woman direct Past Lives? Uh, yeah, Celine Song. Yeah. So a woman directed Past Lives. That movie almost... We you could have taken... Celine, um, Past Lives was also another movie I liked more than Barbie. So that is another that director. Was a, I liked that movie. I would switch... I don't know if I liked it more than Barbie. I would still... I would switch Celine Song in for Martin Scorsese. Yeah, I could see that. Of all those movies? Because Greta Gerwig did a great job directing Barbie. She does a phenomenal job, but I, I my, do feel like maybe the writing credit or the writing um, nomination is more for her recognition overall than the directing. Because I don't think that that movie could have been written by anybody else. I'm not saying that the movie could have been directed by anybody else, but it couldn't have been written by anybody else. Hell, I'll take out Christopher Nolan, too, just to have... Uh, is Christopher Nolan there just because he's Christopher Nolan? I mean, Oppenheimer was a good movie. It was a good movie. But it is low on my list from last year. Yeah, it didn't have the cultural like gravitas. Like, sure, Oppenheimer had the cultural gravitas that Barbie had because it came out the same day as Barbie. It would not have had the same had it just come out on any other day. 
I enjoyed Oppenheimer. I thought it was a beautiful and we'll get to it eventually on this list. I mean but we're talking about directing of film where you do a lot of close ups. Yeah. And a lot of practical effects and an explosion. I know he was trying to keep it very um real. Real. Yeah. There's actual real footage of I mean, that explosion it, that they could have done rather than just big gas ball fire. No, oh, that was a that, beautiful moment. Oh, uh, the that. videos I've watched of people picking apart his <laughs> gas ball fire <laughs> instead of what an actual atomic bomb looks like. Well, okay. So, again, so are we looking at Martin Scorsese and Christopher Nolan as being nominated just because they are who they are? They're not, okay, once again, these are not yeah. bad films. They're not bad they films. They're not, not bad, bad directors. directors. They're they, incredible directors. We're talking about, we're trying to nitpick yeah. five, five slots of... And whether or not year Barbie that should I have really been included in movies. it. Like, I haven't been this excited about the Oscars. You have not been this excited in movies for a long time. Like, you, I've known you for, you know, almost 19 years now. You have been excited about movies this whole time. But I feel like this year, suddenly, it's been amped up a little bit. Like, suddenly, you care more. You're more interested in seeing these niche films like Zone of Interest or Anatomy of a Fall. Like, you... Yeah, I had to hunt down the Zone of Interest yeah. because it, it was still in... Um, limited Limited release release. (laughs) you know and of course we're not saying that none of these people don't deserve any of their accolades they're all incredible people who do things better than we ever could but it does kind of bring up you know that when i think the story about barbie and the oscars is about whether or not margot robbie and greta gerwig were somehow robbed and i don't i mean i think that the case could be made for margot robbie i don't think the case could be made for greta gerwig she's got they both have such incredible careers ahead of them that this movie is not their defining one and only moment we're going to see margot robbie at the oscars again we're going to see her win her oscar one like i said this movie has won 160 awards yeah it's not like the oscars are the only they're the end all be all the other kind of snub in a way was that they were uh, nominated for best adapted screenplay that is weird because the story was adapted from nothing right and the, the, that the then, only thing then, that was you could say was adapted were the names of the characters yeah because that i think then uh ends up co- meaning that they're not gonna win it because they're not gonna win they're it. not gonna win it it should have been because a best original they are up against two. so we've got uh, american fiction which we haven't seen yet, but we are seeing soon. Which just won a BAFTA for... It did. Um, for Good for them. Ri- it writing, looks hysterical. For its writing. So we've got American Fiction, which looks great. Zone of Interest, which you love. Barbie, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. It, what was Poor Things based on? A story? Or I, think a, I think a... A book? book? Okay. So. so, yeah, there, there's no way that Barbie is an adapted story because even as a kid playing with Barbies, the story was never the same. The, the cho- that choice was a very particular choice, almost because I feel like the Oscars didn't, they wanted to acknowledge it, but they didn't want to give it to them. It almost felt like they were afraid of what people would say if they said it was an original screenplay why but either that or they had to make room for all the original screenplays they wanted the top five to be that so what are the i'm looking it up right now so we're looking at best original writing original screenplay. um screenplay thank you i was gonna say score but i knew that wasn't right the holdovers which was my favorite movie that i saw from last year i thought it was wonderful it snuck up on me and slapped me in the face i loved every second of it may december which i haven't seen but i don't want to for very personal reasons Past Lives, which was a beautiful, beautiful story. Anatomy of Fall, which I haven't seen, and Maestro, which I haven't seen and I don't care about. Yeah, and if I could put Barbie in, in any of these, in those, I'd probably throw out Maestro. It really? Was, Over May, December? Oh, it, Maestro from top to bottom is just pandering to the Academy. <laughs> it's an Academy movie. It's an Academy movie, yeah. so... It, it might win, actually. Um, uh, you Anatomy, think that it would win over... It could, but Anatomy of a Falls is going to probably... It just won the Or BAFTA. The Holdovers? The Holdovers is such a good movie. And I know I haven't seen Anatomy of a Falls. I'll see it eventually. But The Holdovers was... A I great mean, movie. It well, was a great that's why I'm movie. Out Maestro. Okay, well, that's fair. We could talk at length about the Oscars, and we will off podcast for sure. Well, then the last two that they were nominated for was production design, which I hope they get. Which, yeah, but uh, poor things has been the uh, lead on that one. Yeah, no, poor things is beautiful. And then uh, costume design, which they might. They they're might probably not going to get. They might. Get, they if. If they're going to win an Oscar other than original song, yeah. it's probably going to be costume. Well, okay, so the other costumes, the costumes that were nominated. Yeah. It's actually surprising. Uh, one Another snub that you could say was Barbie not getting hair and makeup. Barbie deserved hair and makeup. 
especially for the fact that I don't know if you've noticed this, but Barbie's hair goes from being very cool, you know, like properly put together and beautiful and big and fancy and Barbie like at the beginning of the movie. And as she progresses and becomes more human, her hair becomes straighter and less managed, if that makes sense, which I thought was a beautiful touch. The nominations for Barbie is up against Napoleon, Oppenheimer, Poor Things and Killers of the Flower Moon. I've seen Poor Things. The costumes were wonderful. I saw Oppenheimer. The costumes were fine. They didn't take uh, me out of the movie. They were just period costumes. I believe Poor Things has been winning. Yeah. Napoleon, I also didn't see because, oh, fuck, I hate Joaquin Phoenix. And we will get to that when we have to watch The Joker. But, you know, again, that's just period work. Killers of the Flower Moon? Maybe? Sure. It was all very nice period yeah. looking clothing. But, but Which is why Poor Things has been winning. Because yeah. It's, it's but so Poor Things unique. was wacky and weird and wonderful. It's very unique in its but own thing. Barbie, I mean, the costume design for Weird Barbie alone was so good. I mean, Ken and that fucking fur coat that was lined with horse print. Like, that's such... It, I'd probably throw out Oppenheimer. Like, I wasn't impressed with... Like, I wasn't impressed with Oppenheimer. I'm sure, it's all period stuff. Yeah. It's all very just... Yeah, just men in suits and women in... traditional looking suits. 40s. Just people in suits. You're right. A lot of brown suits. Yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of brown suits. There was nothing good I mean, about... at least Napoleon, not a great movie, but at least the costumes looked... Big hats. Looked pretty. Hmm. Yeah, big hats. Big hats. Uh, so yeah, again, we, you know, the, the discourse over the Oscars can just be what it is. Everybody has their opinions. The Oscars will be what they are. And I'm excited to see that, but I do think that Barbie deserves at least something like the production design and the costumes were incredible. I really hope it gets one of the best songs. So after the snubs, as people were saying on the internet, Greta Gerwig actually commented on not getting her and Margot Robbie not mm-hmm. being nominated. And she was doing a woman of the year profile for time magazine. So, I mean, right there she's winning. Yeah. And she said, of course I wanted it for Margot, but I'm just happy. We all get to be there together. Mm-hmm. I mean, Margot Robbie is still a producer yeah. on this movie, in, which is producers get to, go yeah, I mean, to the they're movies. not going to, win best no they're not picture, gonna win best but, picture yeah. but they they get to go to the party together and um gerwig's expressing her joy for the, how well the movie did and yeah. how many nominations it's receiving um she said a friend's mom said to me i can't believe you didn't get nominated and she replied but i did i got an oscar nomination she was like oh that's wonderful for you <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, it's not that it's not that these uh, two women haven't been in any way given their flowers for this movie. They absolutely have been. I don't know why it's the, is it just because the, like you know it's fucking America and America, fuck yeah, that the Oscars are the end all be all. You know what about the Baftas? What about all the other awards that they've won, the Golden Globes, the whatnot? You know they made an incredible thing, but they didn't make it for the awards. They made it oh, for how not, it affects people. This is something people. that they get to enjoy. At yeah, the it's end how it affects their... people. As for the best original song nominees, obviously I'm just Ken. I hope wins because I think it's a brilliant fucking song. It's I feel like it's gonna go to What Was I Made For because I could just see them not letting the silly song win. I don't know what the fire inside is from. From um it's from Flamin the Hot. Flaming Hot, yeah. The Flaming story Hot was a movie. Uh, How did that get any nominations Cheetos. when that not it's not because it was a song about Cheetos, but it turned out that that song was or that whole story was a fraud. That they guy made, made a, up that entire story. They still made a. Uh, but they still an original an original song, song that got it. That was good enough um, to get on the list. A John Baptiste song from uh, um, American Symphony, which, which was a beautiful movie. I only watched part of it with you, but it was really, really beautiful. Uh, I don't feel like it's been any of the. It's not been one of the um, big ones. Um, like, has it won anything? That. Fire inside, or it never went away. Mm, I don't think so. But no, it at least got. I mean, John Baptiste is going to egot one day. Like we all are very aware of this. And then the last song is um, from Killers of a Flower Moon, which I I don't know the song. I, I can't say one way or another. I saw the movie, but I didn't. Yeah, I don't know what um, the song exactly. 
So I really want it to go to I'm Just Ken. I think well, that that I'm would be wonderful. Well, I'm Just Ken's been winning. Yeah. I mean, everybody has seen that footage of Ryan Gosling winning for that song at the at some movie awards and him just being completely shocked that he won, which I think is great. I do have a very special place in my heart for the best original song category from the Oscars, and I have for a long time since probably when uh, Enya was nominated for The Fellowship of the Ring. I have a deep love for the movie Once, and it won the best original song for the beautiful song uh, Falling Slowly. Of course, I thoroughly enjoyed seeing the Lonely Island play at the Oscars for Everything is Awesome, which should have won. I remember when Robin Williams sang Blame Canada at the Oscars when Matt and Trey were there tripping on acid dressed like female celebrities. Like, I, you know, I love the best original song portion. I always have. So I really hope that I'm just Ken gets it. I hope that production design or costume design gets it as well. But you're right. Poor things will probably dominate. And no matter what, it doesn't change the fact that I love the Barbie movie. I think it's great. It's fun. It's funny. It's heartfelt. It's all these things that I want to see a movie to be. And uh, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a favorite of mine. And I'm glad that we got to talk about it together. And I think that is the end of the podcast, the first podcast. The first podcast. First it was episode. fun. We it's, recorded for a lot longer than I thought we would, but this is about right for well, us. Well, you know, it's, yeah, we <laughs> can talk for hours, and because of this podcast, we, we will we will talk <laughs> for hours about movies, and this is why we uh, like them so much, and this is definitely something that Maggie and I have um Always wanted to do. Always wanted to do. Did you have fun? Oh, I had so much fun just talking about, just sitting here in our quiet living room talking about uh, things. A really great movie. And just uh, being in each other's presence. Aww. Gross. It's nerd love, guys. It's forever. Uh, Until next time, we hope you have a wonderful week and go mingle. Bye. Are you an effective team? We are an effective team. Let them fight. How did you just do that? I'm a really good lawyer. Here on Caladan, we've ruled by air power and sea power. On Arrakis, we need to cultivate desert power. Welcome, Mr. Beach. Where's that bond? Uh, I'm a little confused. Well, we wouldn't want that, would we? I don't want to brag, but I will. I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? I want to make him an offer again with you. Toga, 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 toga.